All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue with our lecture. Um, so where we left off, we were talking about this whole negative feedback concept. I'm going to try my best, <laughs> just bear with me using a mouse instead of like a pen or anything, uh, to show that negative feedback loop again, uh, just try to simplify it on this uh, white screen that I have. Uh, but one of the last things we talked about uh, are a separate set of glands found on the thyroid. So if I just scroll up a little bit, this is to show us the thyroid once again. Again, it's found on the anterior side, so the front side of the thyroid, or of the uh, neck, sorry. On the back side of the neck, so on the back side of the thyroid itself, we actually have these tiny, tiny, small glands called the parathyroid gland. So the parathyroid, just to scroll down into some new information, it is involved with uh, special types of cells. We have what's called chief cells and these abundant oxyphil cells. Again, that's a little bit more detailed than we may need for now. But what we do need to know is PTH. So I'm gonna scroll down to here. So PTH, the function of PTH or parathyroid hormone, sometimes referred to as parathormone, just to kind of blend it all together. The whole job of PTH is to increase the blood calcium levels. We're gonna to try to do our best here to underline that. So increase blood calcium levels when you, things get too low. It's essentially the opposite of calcitonin. So mechanism of raising blood calcium stimulates osteoclasts to, re to release more calcium from the bone, decrease secretion of calcium by the kidneys. Start a timer up for us, sorry. Okay. Uh, decreases secretion of calcium by the kidneys, activates vitamin D, which helps to stimulate the uptake of calcium from the intestines. Um, so the, the whole idea down here is that unwitting removal um, during a thyroidectomy used to be lethal. So removal of the thyroid itself, oftentimes this could be due to uh, thyroid issues, cancer, many other problems associated with it. Used to be something lethal just due to the fact that calcium couldn't be controlled. Nowadays, in the, in the instance that a thyroid is removed, you can take uh, supplements to help regulate your body in the, in the instance that your thyroid has been removed. So again, the big thing here, again, I'll just underline this, or circle this for us, has an opposite effect on calcium as calcitonin. So just to kind of write it down, I guess, to the side here, uh, we're going to go ahead and say that calcitonin calcitonin is going to decrease your blood calcium levels. Whereas PTH, this up here. Remember, PTH stands for, as you can see on the slide, parathyroid hormone. PTH is going to, in turn, increase calcium levels. That is the gist of it. There's more to it than just that, as usual. You know, this is an introductory anatomy course, so there's more information involved, but this is fine this is all we would need for now so to go back into that whole negative feedback concept let me do my best to work this out here so first i'm just going to go ahead and label this up here so let's just say negative whoa okay did not know i was gonna do that <laughs> all right never mind we don't need to worry about this this is obviously getting a little out of hand Forget it. Okay. The entire concept of negative feedback is revolved around how much of something do you have? Where are you with homeostasis? Um, so this is the best example I can say. Uh, let's say you have, let me actually see if I can blow this up a little bit. Okay. Let's say you have five apples. In the instance that you have five apples, let's say that's the perfect amount of apples, you're happiest with five. In the instance that you have too many apples, so you have seven for some reason, your best bet is to give away two. 
You just give away two more apples and now you're back to your happy state of five, right? Or let's say the opposite happens and you have now three apples and you are looking to get your five. So you grab two more apples from your orchard or whatever you may have. The same, the idea is always going to be the same. You can obviously apply something very simplistic, like I just said, into something more anatomy oriented, but you're always trying to stay in homeostasis and regulation. You want to make sure that the levels of calcium don't go too high or too low. So you just want to keep them in regulation. And that's the whole premise of negative feedback. You want to just keep things as maintained as possible. All right, let's go ahead and scroll down a little bit. We'll erase some of the extra. All right. Okay. Uh, oh, some of this stuff is still showing up. Okay, so if we originally started in the brain, right, with the pituitary gland, um, we actually never talked too much about the pineal gland, but we kind of talked about that back in nervous system part two. It secretes melatonin, uh, which we'll get into that anyway. Uh, but if we started with the brain, with the pituitary, I like to call that the master gland, and then we work our way down into the neck, which we have the thyroid and the parathyroid. So now we've listed three glands. Now we're working our way down we have what's called the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands do have another name. They're also referred to as the suprarenal. Supra typically as a prefix means above. So in this case, if we are looking at the kidneys, you can see how the adrenal glands are these like triangular shaped hats that sit on top of the kidneys. That's the whole idea. Honestly, I'm fine with just adrenal glands. Don't have to get too crazy. So, and renal as a, pre, as a suffix indicates um, kidneys, as we'll learn when we do our urinary system. So the suprarenal glands or the adrenal glands, as we like to call them, there are two of them since we have two kidneys. So there are two separate endocrine glands. Uh, and then on top of that, inside the gland itself, as you can tell here, we have the medulla and the cortex. So the cortex is going to be the outer layer of the adrenal gland, whereas the medulla is going to be the inner layer. So just to use a little bit of color to give us a little bit of pop here. Let's go ahead and say that this whole region is going to be the cortex. And we'll just keep it blue for now. Let's say that this whole region is going to be the medulla. It's very similar to how the kidneys are structured, actually. The kidneys have a cortex, the kidneys have a medulla, so they're very similar in structure. They're just obviously different function and purpose overall. Uh, unre unrelated chemicals, but all help with extreme situations. So the chemicals secreted by the cortex versus the medulla, they're not necessarily in the same family. It's more so they are both responsible for maintaining your body in extreme scenarios. Here we're able to see the position um, your kidneys are typically in your lower quadrant region, one on each side, left and right. Um, as some of you may know, you can live with one kidney in, in an instance where you need to lose one or donate one or whatever the case may be. Um, but your kidneys are obviously necessary for your body's functionality. Adrenal glands, no different. Here we're able to see uh, just the structures that make up the adrenal glands as far as their layers. Don't have to get too crazy with that. All right, don't need to worry about that. Okay, so with regards to the adrenal cortex, so if we recall, just to scroll back up, the adrenal cortex is the outer layer. My letters like to stay around for a little bit longer. There you go. The adrenal cortex is going to be responsible for secreting lipid-based hormones. These lipid-based hormones, some of you have maybe heard of before, especially if you have uh, family members or parents that are in the medical field, uh, corticosteroids. So as far as the corticosteroids are concerned, there are two major ones. Uh, let's go ahead and just underline a little bit here. The primary one we're going to talk about is called aldosterone. And then there's another one that a lot of people have heard of before called cortisol, also known as hydrocortisone as far as another name that it has. Um, the reason why we see that cortico as far as in the naming is because of the cortex. It has to do with where it's also created from. Steroids, as we've learned in the past, are just fat-based uh, hormones, okay? 
The medulla, on the other hand, so the inner structure of the, of the adrenal glands, is going to secrete two particular hormones that basically counteract each other, or they're like a yin and yang situation. We have epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine have common names that a lot of people have heard of before. Adrenaline and noradrenaline may have heard of that in the past. So let's go ahead and just erase so we don't have this stuff sliding down again. Okay. All right. Aldosterone. The major hormone released from the adrenal cortex. So it is a mineral corticoid. Uh, we don't need to worry too much about that. Again, I'm fine with just knowing the name of uh, aldosterone, obviously, and what a corticosteroid is. But it is secreted by the adrenal cortex in response to a decline in either blood volume or blood pressure, aka hemorrhaging. Hemorrhaging is when you lose a lot of blood. Obviously, the levels of hemorrhaging vary. Hemorrhaging could technically be you get a paper cut and you start losing a little bit of blood from your finger, for instance. Is that emergency levels? For most people, no. I mean, in some situations, possibly, especially if someone has a blood condition that can cause them to lose more blood. But no, this shouldn't be a problem. But on the other hand, let's say you're prepping dinner, chop, chop, chop with a knife, and then you slice off a whole finger. That's obviously a little bit more careful and a little bit more concerning as far as the amount of blood that you'd be losing. Um, so again, this is a hormone that is directly involved with that response to blood volume loss or increase in uh, or dec a decrease in blood pressure as well. Interestingly enough, it doesn't have to necessarily just be like an accident. Uh, if you donated blood, you know that's something that could be directly linked to this. That's a purposeful reason why your blood volume would be low, and your aldosterone levels would then in turn skyrocket. Uh, it is involved in what's called the renin angiotensin mechanism. We're good with that. Don't have to worry too much about that. But what we want to know is that it helps to promote distal and collecting tubules in the kidneys to reabsorb more sodium. The water will passively follow and in turn is going to cause blood volume to increase. So it does inevitably cause blood volume to increase up by reabsorbing more sodium. And where do we obtain our sodium? Mostly from our diet, right? You also get quite a bit of sodium from just like electrolyte-based things. So oftentimes your Gatorades and your Powerades and those type of energy or like power uh, sports drinks, if you want to call them that. Um, yes, they have a lot of sugar, but they do have quite a bit of electrolytes that can help with the reabsorption of fluid. All right. <laughs> this is going to be the theme of today's episode, this letter P popping back up. All right. Cortisol, the other major hormone secreted by the cortex. So cortico or cortisol is co known as a glucocorticoid. Again, we're fine with that. We don't have to worry too much about that. I'm fine with just knowing that it's secreted by the adrenal cortex. Um, uh, it is essential for life. This hormone plays a very important role in many aspects. Helps the body deal with stressful situations within minutes. Uh, so for example, on a physical sense, it can help your body deal with trauma, surgery, exercise that doesn't sound like it belongs to the other two but think about it when you're exercising you are literally ripping apart muscle you're doing it for a good reason though right it not only strengthens your body and it builds up endurance for your body but it has exercise a number of positive effects as we already know but on a physical level yes that is considered a traumatic instance to your body so it helps with your body deal with that trauma not to mention, like, let's say you're in, the ins you're, you're in surgery, for example. So that could be a much more serious situation. It could be even something like we mentioned earlier, donating blood, basically a wound of some sort, even if it's a purposeful wound. On a psychological level, cortisol can also help with anxiety, depression, and crowding. So people that suffer from severe anxiety, because all of us, every single one of us have anxiety, right? This is not a unique aspect. But people that suffer from severe anxiety, there have been links to low levels of cortisol, the hormone itself, in their bloodstream. If you don't have enough cortisol, it can be difficult to surpass that anxiety, to get over that hump, if you want to think of it that way. Same thing with depression, although those are obviously different things. And then as far as crowding is concerned, I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this before, and I've, I've dealt with this in the past. Sometimes you go to an event, 
and there's hundreds of thousands of people or tens of thousands of people or even just a thousand people and you get that moment of looking around and you get that whoa like wow there's a lot of people here i kind of feel like a small fish in a big pond mindset what cortisol helps with is that it helps to kind of calm you down and ease you if you want to think of it that way so that you feel okay you're like all right this isn't a big deal there are people that can't deal with that very well there are people that have phobias of these crowded locations and again that could be directly linked to cortisol issues and then on a physiological level so this is just how your body works right remember physiology how things work fasting hypoglycemia fever infection just to name a few things with cortisol these are all things that cortisol can help with or help manage Fasting, of course, is just that you're limiting your liquids and food, more importantly, food for a prolonged period of time. Your body essentially goes into like a starvation state. We'll talk about that in digestive. Hypoglycemia is when you have low blood sugar. So when your blood sugar goes low, gets low, cortisol can help to regulate your body and say, we're okay, we'll find energy somewhere else. It's not the end of the world. Fever and infection, same idea. When your body is fighting something, fever can be something super beneficial because it does increase your body temperature and it can kill off a lot of viruses. But when you're at plus 98.6, especially when you're in that 100 plus range, yeah, the rest of your body cells don't work well in an oven. So that can be problematic. And then the same thing with just infection. Your immune system is fighting. It's hard to keep everything regular, regular, uh, regulated and then just overall functioning well. Um, so overall here we see regulates or supports a variety of important cardiovascular, metabolic, immunologic, and homeostatic functions, including water balance. I can't say enough about just how important cortisol is. People with adrenal insufficiencies, these stresses can cause hypotension, shock, and death. You must give them glucocorticoids uh, for surgery or have infections. So basically people that deal with adrenal problems. So their adrenal glands are not secreting specifically like the cortex hormones. So that includes your aldosterone, that includes your cortisol you do need to be very careful with these people. Lastly, as far as for today's lesson, cortisol overall helps to keep blood glucose levels high enough to support brain activity. Uh, so that's very important on just the day-to-day -day routine. Remember how I mentioned way back in nervous system, <laughs> it feels like forever ago at this point, but in nervous system, so quarter three, I mentioned that the brain utilizes upwards to about 40% of your body's energy, stored energy. That doesn't sound like a lot, but that is a substantial amount for just one organ. If you've ever been through a moment, especially I, all of us have gone there, and I've definitely been there before, where you were testing all day, or you just had a lot of classwork all day, and you probably didn't get enough sleep, you feel bogged down. You feel exhausted, even though maybe you never physically put yourself through a lot and it's because just like any other muscle the brain can get tired down it's the same thing here if you don't have cortisol levels functioning properly it's it can become difficult to maintain your brain energy necessities as far as giving your and the brain the energy it requires to keep functioning at the level it needs to do um it can be catabolic so it helps to break down protein that can be good and bad in most cases it just depends on the scenario we do redirect circulating lymphocytes to avoid lymphoids and peripheral tissues where pathogens usually are uh in large quarantines depresses immune and inflammatory responses or so, sorry in large quant quantities not quarantines in large quantities depresses immune and inflammatory response usually therapeutic responsible for some of its side effects so in a situation where the immune system is going rampant you are dealing with something very serious and unfortunately your fever hasn't really gotten under control inflammation is spreading like wildfire um a lot of cortisol so you can actually be given cortisol levels artificial cortisol levels can help with controlling that extreme reaction of the immune system um again can be therapeutic but this is totally in a controlled environment this is not something that's just like hey take it willy-nilly this would have to be in a hospital setting with people obviously watching over you all right so that's what we're going to finish for today's video uh thanks again for watching uh tune in for the next one